Okay, great. Welcome everybody. Today's topic is quite a hot one, storytelling with data, especially with Power BI. And we are together with uh, Carrie Kolosko today. As far as I can see, she is one of the most enthusiastic people uh, about data visualization. Uh, I love her work. Uh, I leave the introduction to you, Kerry. Uh, I'm handing over to you directly. Okay, cool. Um, I don't know that I've really prepared an introduction, to be honest, but uh, my name is Kerry Colosco and I am from South Australia and sunny South Australia, although now it's winter and it's quite cold outside and I've got my uh, hot water bottle on my lap to keep me warm. Um, and I'm a data viz consultant and um, I'm very, very passionate about data viz. I, I find it really very enjoyable um, and it's uh, I find it quite cathartic. Um, it's a slight hobby for me as well. So um, I, I do tend to put a lot more time into it than I really uh, should at times. But um, yeah, so my tool of choice is Power BI as well. I do play around with some other tools to, to get some of the, the techniques that I need and learn and, and grow in that area. Um, but my presentation today is about um, Power BI and data visuals. So I'm just going to turn my camera off so they find it distracting while I talk. Um, okay. So I'm just focus on my on what I'm talking a bit. And then share the screen. Well, so um, what I'm going to show today is um, a data viz project from start to finish. And the idea is to walk through the process um, that I tend to go through sometimes in um, creating data visuals. Um, and the typical process um, that I'm going to be walking through is uh, you know, quite typical. I'll look at the data, uh, understand where it is, where it comes from. I might then go and explore the data by throwing a few visuals onto the canvas um, to understand it, see the shape. Um, and the next step that is quite typical in the data design projects is then trying to look to see what kind of insights that we get. Um, you might have a few questions and um, a few hypotheses that we test, and then find, we might find something that's interesting. Some of our hypotheses might be proved or disproved. And then after that process, we might start to think about how to present the data to an audience, how we start to frame our information to tell a story, and then think about the design and how we want to visually present the data in an, an engaging and easily consumable way. Um, but quite often that process is not linear. So we tend to um, go about, uh, you know, our reality is a design process may happen in any order. We might explore, find insights, explore again, investigate our data um, again, and then we might start with our story, start the design process, tweak the story again. So um, it's not quite as straightforward as, as we have it out to be. But the two um, visuals that I'm going to be touching on. Um, so the first visual here is um, one that I did in a design challenge. These two visuals I did throw up quite quickly. Um, so you know, if I were to do them again, there's a lot more improvements that I would make to them, but you know, that's fine. Um, I'll talk through those as I, I go to um, go through them. And the first one started off with a very, very small data set. And I had a lot of fun in this challenge because the data set was so small and trying to see uh, what information and insights I could gather out of it was um, fun. Uh, but at the same time, whilst doing that, I was trying to be careful not to um, try and find insights that weren't there, try and see things that weren't there. So, um, you know, you can interrogate your um, data and, and torture it long enough, um, which is an expression you can hear out in the community, that you'll find something um, which I wanted to try and avoid as well. So I didn't, in my storytelling, I didn't jump to huge conclusions in there as well. Um, the Harry Potter one was also another design challenge, and this was a much richer data set. And um, there were some interesting insights to be um, pulled out of this data set and the design process in this was quite different. Um, so I'll be talking to that as well. Um, so I guess the first thing I do when I um, look at my data, the first thing I do is I you know, grab my data and I look at it. So um, with the friends data set here, it was... Uh, it is a oh. little bit small, that's it. 
Yes, and it's very slow. <laughs> it doesn't seem. Ah, because I'm pressing the wrong button. What am I doing? Ah, that's funny. Oh, it's so slow. Here we go. Don't know if that helps a little bit. Not it's much. You dropped uh, for a moment, Kerry. Am I here? Can you hear me now? Yes. 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 Beautiful. Um, so there's only nine columns. And so the first column is the year of production of the um, Friends episode. Then we go on to the season, um, the episode number, the episode title. So there's a bit of text here. Um, the duration of the episodes. Um, a short summary text, which is generally about four sentences long, uh, the director of the episode, and then we've got the rating, the stars, and then we've got the votes, so the amount of people that voted and, and gave a rating for the episode. So it's not an awful lot of data. Mm, let me get my keys right. There we go. But then, um, I you know starts to thinking about what kind of questions I wanted to ask. And so the overarching question, um, part of the challenge is, you know, what makes an episode popular? And from the list of um, fields that I had, the two, two things that I could use to perhaps measure popularity were the number of um, votes. So that could be indicative of the number of people watching the episode, the viewership. So the more people that view an episode, um, you know, that might define it as being a popular episode and then the stars and the ratings so the higher the rating given to a um, episode that makes it more popular and then the variables that I could use to to test this question you know so um does a director make a, a pop uh, episode more popular or does the season make it more uh, popular or does the episode number make it more popular so there were three that I could use straight away um there were other things that potentially so um so the summary, I couldn't use directly as it was because there wasn't um, enough uh, categories to be able to form those relationships as it stood. And same with the episode title. I wasn't going to get any relationships, um, interesting insights out of, the, out of those um, as they were. So um, the first thing I then did was to, you know, just draw things immediately on the canvas using just your normal out of the box visuals to start to see if I can see any immediate obvious difference in ratings by each of these variables. Um, what I saw was that there wasn't a lot of variability, right? So there wasn't a lot of differences in the averages, um, except over here, when we're looking at the episode number, there seems to be a little bit of a pattern, but you know, not an awful lot of variability. So then the next um, thing I went to do from that was then to try and um, understand, well, what's the distribution of ratings? And I can see here using a histogram, and this one being from a Microsoft Visual from the um, App Source, I can see that there wasn't a, a you know a huge variability. So the lowest score was 7.2 um, stars, and the highest score was 9.7 stars. Um, you know, with a concentration around uh, you know eight stars, which meant that it was quite consistently um, all the episodes in the Friends series were quite um, consistently rated high. Um, I don't know how that compares to other series, but I'm pretty sure that the Friends is probably one of the most um, popular rated series in IMDb, um, which kind of sets the scene for the rest of the questions and makes me understand why I couldn't see much of that variability. So um, the average was then uh, 4.6 and the median was 8.4. And then I also went to test the um, you know standard deviation as well, because that can be an interesting way to look at things um, in future when you're comparing the distributions. So I think I don't know if I did it like this. Um, I would say that we go that way like so. And then the standard deviation is um, 0 0.4, which is um, a good measure from that. So then um, going back to that original shape, what I wanted to then look at was, you know, 
this is an interesting uh, shape. Does it mean that there's a, you know, a mid-season um, bump in ratings, you know, in terms of patterns? So I drew that out by the season, seeing if um, that there was any interest, anything interesting to see there. And it seemed to look like it was taking a bit of a pattern where there was a pre, um, uh, you know, a slump before the end of the season here. And they didn't seem to be huge um, jump in mid-season ratings. They didn't seem to particular pattern. Um, but it was very spaghetti. Um, and what I wanted to do then is just see the, see the points so I can see the density of those, those points a little bit more clearly. And then from that, I've overlaid because I'm trying to be quick, a scatter plot and a line chart um, from the out of the box visuals. So I, I layered the average line over the top of the scatter point line. And it was interesting because the average line just didn't really seem to fit the shape of the, the scatter plot. And um, what I came to understand was that because there were scatter points laid underneath each other, so there were multiple points underneath each other, so I wasn't really getting a good view of of what was going on here and that the average line was a little bit too jumpy. So going from then, I just wanted to look at that a little bit more deeply. And um, I then used a custom visual, which is this denim custom visual here um, from the app source to create um, some jitter so that I can see that density a little bit more clearly um, between the um, ordinal episode numbers here. And I smoothed the average line initially, and it was starting to take a bit more of a, a shape here. And then I thought, well, I'll try again, and I'll try and do a line of best fit using a polynomial line or a, a lowest regression, um, like so in here. And then you can kind of see now that there is a bit more density and the shape that it's taking, um, it looks, to, it appears that, you know, most of the, um, ending at the season finale episodes rate higher than the um, opening episodes. And a little quick peek into the denim visual and you can have a little look at um, what's going on there as well. So I've got that, that scattered jitter here and I've got my um, points on the first layer. And then I've got the mark line, which is that black line on that second layer here. Um, so then, you know, I tested that theory, right? So, you know, is is that to the season finales rate better than the opening episodes? And I found that, yes, they did on average. So pretty much all of the season finales using this slope chart here are rated higher, excepting the very first, excepting season two. And season nine was just a slight deviation. And then that had made, made, you know, made me wonder, well, why is that? Because they had more viewers. Um, and so at this point, I started to plot the um, number of votes over time. And um, I could see that there's something interesting to look at here. But the thing with lines is that um, it's hard, even though lines are great in terms of time series, sometimes it's hard to choose, uh, judge the magnitude of individual events. Um, and which is what I'm looking at, it's individual episodes. So I went then to a point line, so a point um, with the line graph underneath. And um, initially I had it without the line. Um, it was sort of hard to find sort of follow that, um, the flow. And I wanted to follow the, the trend. So I popped that line back in, but I made it very subtle. And you can see um, from looking at it that the uh, number of votes for the, um, over time for each of the episodes, you know, is fairly consistent, but there's a few little peaks um, which were interesting that I wanted to look at. And we can see that that one doesn't really tell you anything. You know, there's nothing really to be gained. There's not really any themes or any um, times, you know, you can really gather from that. But what I did note is that, um, yes, right? So the question was, um, 
does the viewership seem to matter? And if you trace the first episode and the last episode in terms of viewership between the things, you can see that they pretty much line up. So season two, for example, um, the first episode rated higher than the last one. But for all the other ones, um, this season here, they're, they're higher. So there seemed to be a relationship. Um, so then I wanted to look at that relationship. Um, so to do that was to, to again, um, using the out-of-the-box visuals, create a scatter plot. And I can see here that there does seem to be some sort of relationship. But again, I'm getting confounded by the fact that, um, you know, most of these points are sort of overlaid a little bit. And I, I can't really see the density. If you're looking at the histogram, it doesn't really show uh, that very well. So I went back in again to the Zeneb. and try to find that that line of best fit um, as well. And you know, initially I started with a um, linear uh, line of best fit, but um, the, the line goes beyond the um, number 10, but the 10 is a ceiling. Um, you can't get votes higher than 10, so I had a look at doing some um, polynomial type, type fits. And then the last variable of all the variables that I, I looked at was the directorship. So those first three variables anyway. Um, and the question here was, well, did the directors have um, anything to do with the popularity of an episode? And this one actually produced a much better result. Um, so the thing um, with looking at the distribution here is I needed to be sure that I was comparing you know, equal distributions. Um, so if you've got distributions of one, three, and two, you're not really going to get any insights out of that. Even though we've got a complete data set, it's not really a sample, and we've got all of the episodes that were produced, um, you still have to be very careful in terms of uh, the statements that you infer and the conclusions that you draw. But if you look here at the um, number of episodes that Gavin and Kevin and the um, other group here, 43 samples, um, you can see that you know, Kevin did produce um, higher uh, results than, sorry, uh, who's the other one? Uh, Gary here, down here, right? Relatively significant. And if you're looking at um, Ben, David, Peter, and Gail, you can see that David, um, with the distribution here, definitely produced um, higher rating episodes than uh, Gail and um, Ben in terms of comparing their distribution here. So um, that was a, a good positive result. I'm going to pause here if anybody has any um, questions. Please feel free to ask your questions. Just unmute yourself or write it uh, in the chat window. Actually, I have a question for you and I, I I think this is one of the most uh, important question, according to me, in my opinion. What does it require to make a transition uh, from these awful looking average bar charts to histograms or scatter diagrams or. I mean, uh, it, it, many people, including myself, start with creating awful bar chart like diagrams first. And then we start thinking about how can I show this information differently so that it will tell us more about the situation. What do you think it requires us? I mean, what do we need? What do we need to know? Is it the business or is it about asking the right question? Or thinking way? What do you think? Um, I think it's knowing the different ways that you can encode your data. Um, so it's sort of being mindful um, that you can encode data, you know, by various ways such as point, position, length, um, color. It's actually a really tricky question to to think about. That how do you go from bar? And I guess it. It takes a while to think about, you know, what's the grain as well that um, you want to to look at your data. Um, so the more granular you look at your data, the more um, different chart types that you, you need to think about. 
And I guess it's the way that you want to explore your data. So if you think about asking your questions, you think very carefully about the words that you're asking. So, do, you know, do you want to compare two points in time or do you want to compare things over time? Right. And then you can start to think about what that means visually. And um, I guess the next question is like, you know, do you want to measure the degree in change, for example? So, you know, if you're thinking about comparing two points in time, you might be comparing bars. If you're thinking over time, you might be doing lines because that that's representative of, of transition through time. And if you're thinking about the degree of change, you might be looking, thinking about, you know, the slopes and angles and positioning. So if you you phrase your question and think what it is you want to try and see in phase and then think very carefully about the words you're using and then how that can be represented visually that can start to change your perspective a little bit so you're not thinking about the recommended charts that are in your toolbox you're thinking about you know if you were to draw it yourself from scratch what would you do it's sort of thinking differently it's changing that taxonomy did that answer your question yeah exactly i i think it's a combination of a lot of skills you need to know how to ask the right questions yeah uh, you need to understand a little bit statistics maybe oh yes yes uh, for example everybody should know what uh, what histogram is for and uh if you're able to add some technical information specific to power bi then you can create start creating a great look, looking reports and there's a one question about uh, about the chart in page 16 i guess uh yeah, to create yeah. fitted lines in 16 page 16 it was then i guess yes So what was the question? Uh, how, how did you create it? <laughs> oh, yes, it is with um, Deneb. Oh, that's the wrong. Try not to show the beta version. Oops. Then get it in the non beta version. There we go. Um, so it's using um, Deneb. So you're layering. Um, so your first layer here is your point marks, which is dots here. Um, and then the second layer is your line. So I think this one is a polynomial. So I was trying out um, different types of fit, and this is an order of three. So if I change that to an order of four, um, I'll get a bit more of a curvy look, right? And um, sometimes when you're looking at lines of best fit and regression, you, you do tend to do this a bit more by eye um, as well. So. And so with that line, uh, you've got the transform, which is your regression, and it's on the votes. Um, and then you've got your encoding, which is your, your votes here for your X axes. And then you've got your encoding on your Y here, which is your, your stars. So that's how that's created. Great. Uh, Deneb is one of the most versatile custom visuals for Power BI. Everybody should play with it. It should get started with it, yes. Absolutely. Okay. Exactly. Cool. Uh, um, Pranam, could you please unmute yourself and ask your question? Uh, sure, Ali. Uh, uh, again, most of my report viewers are from Excel background, so basically they're very comfortable. In fact, the only charts they have seen is uh, bar graph, line graph, and pie charts, basically. Uh, but now, when I move them to uh, you know Power BI, how do I bring them around to histograms and scatter uh, you know plots? Because in most cases, when I introduce a new visual, I have to actually walk them through and explain to them, okay, this is how the visualization is, and this is how the analysis is. Uh, yeah, it, it would be easier if it is at a one-on-one -on -one basis. But when I'm having uh, you know this report sent out to say uh, 20 or 30 or maybe a wider uh, uh, you know uh, range of uh, uh, viewers, how do I uh, communicate that to them without having to them uh, spending too much time or me spending too much time with them? Great question. Um, Thank you. It is a, a great question, and I guess it's something that do you need to present the chart as it is? Um, that is it beneficial for them to to see that the histograms and if if you feel that it is they, um, good for them to understand and understand the data and, and the story that you're trying to tell them, then definitely um, you know 
make sure there's you, you've got the description in a paragraph and words describing what the, the chart is and uh, what the insight is to be gained from the chart. Um, so, you know, provide a, set, a text summary um, alongside it and just to say, well, this is the supporting evidence. This is what you can see from the chart. This is what you can gain. And this is the insight to be derived. And I think that'd be fine. And then once they start to start to learn over time how to read it, you'll need to do that sort of less and less, hopefully. Does that help? Oh, yes, Ken. Uh, because uh, the way they have looked at reports is tables, basically. And as you know, a table will not give you any kind of an analysis. For example, histogram. Compared to histogram on a table, it just maybe it's like hundreds of thousands of rows. Uh, or even if you summarize them also, it, it, it won't tell you uh, column A to column B or row one to row two, whether it has gone up or gone down. So I'm trying to move my viewers from a table or these bar graphs, mm. which again, it, 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 I'm not I'm not saying that uh, it's their fault. It's just that these were the options available to them, and that's what they have used to. Now, how do I slowly move them to these uh, new graphs? Yeah, and uh, what you said, yeah, makes sense. Maybe instead of just looking at a dashboard, as you rightly said, maybe uh, have these additional uh, summaries basically uh, on mm. uh, each of these new uh, charts. Yeah, that really helps. Yeah, cool. All right, so I'd, I'd like to turn my camera off when I talk. Um, so yeah, so then, you know, I did that and I basically, you know, I only, only did three variables and only had one really solid conclusion from, from, what, from that little data. So then I went back to these episode titles and these summaries and um, these were a lot of text and I had to think about these and I thought, well, what can I do with this text? And what I noticed from a little scan through and, and a glance is that they had the characters' names in the, the text, and then they had some themes. So, you know, words like dies and, um, you know, friendship and killed and, um, you know, maid of honour, which means there might be some themes about weddings in there um, as well. So I thought, um, well, maybe I can, you know, get some some character names out of this and see if the characters potentially have a um, impact on the popularity of episodes. And also maybe there's some themes of information, there's some topics I can pull out of this. Um, so I started with the first thing and um, had a look to see, you know, did character popularity um, have an impact? And that there wasn't much there. And so when looking at the numbers, um, I could see that, you know, they pretty much featured fairly equally, you know, out of all of the episodes. I just wasn't going to see a lot. Um, with that data and I thought well maybe if I segment it a little bit more um, you know maybe I can see whether pop, uh, you know character popularity may have changed over time for different um, characters and it looked like there may be a pattern here but um, I couldn't really draw any conclusion it looked like Ross increased with the popularity and Rachel went down with popularity but, you know, I was probably seeing something that wasn't there that I just don't think that there was anything really to be drawn out of that. And I was just wishing too hard. Um, and then also I looked, you know, maybe there's character sets. So um, maybe there's like um, episodes might be more popular with Ross and Rachel or Joey and Chandler. And so I um, put in an upset plot to try and have a look at these character sets. Um, and didn't really see anything there either. Like what was interesting though, was there was um, the episodes that didn't feature any characters were a lot higher than the rest. And when I looked at what those episodes were, they featured the phrase, the gang. So I thought, oh, I'll pull that out and see what I can find that's interesting there. And then again, using um, Deneb, so with this um, set of plots in the visuals, you can't put ordinal data down the bottom. So I, I leveraged um, Deneb again to um, you know, look at these character sets. Um, didn't really see anything interesting, except for Rachel seemed to be quite popular. Um, and then I looked at um, you know, number of characters. So you know, two, three, four, five, six, and then the episodes that featured none were higher. The episodes that featured one were higher, and then they dipped, and then they increased um, again when, when they came to all of the characters. But again, I didn't think that was really interesting either. So. Um, and then looking at it, uh, oh, I've got a notification. Um, looking at it, so I pulled out the gang just to see what I could see from that. Um, yes, they looked to be a lot higher. So there was about 16 episodes that featured the gang, but 
but um, again, the, the sample size wasn't that great. So the sample size is oh no, 16 compared to episodes with 147. So I wasn't comparing apples with apples. It was still, you know, interesting though. Um, and then again, so, you know, were there any obvious um, themes or topics from the summary text as well? Um, so I didn't have the tooling for the sentiment analysis or text analysis or things like that. Um, I just uh, ended up using a word cloud. Um, again, this is another Microsoft Visual, but from the App Store. And uh, through the summary text in there to see if I can um, just have a look at what were the, the bigger names. And I can see things like wedding, um, things like, you know, girlfriend struggles, um, there's a few names, Emily, Kathy, um, married, birthday. And I thought, oh, you know, that, that restaurant, we, you know, so we had uh, wedding had uh, 18 mentions. Um, maybe I could pull out something from that. And um, so using a bit of Power Query, um, using text contains, I did a count of these most popular um, words and found that Thanksgiving came at the top. Um, with an average of 8.8 .8 stars, which is much higher than average. If we think about um, the, the distribution of the votes, um, the average being 8.46 and um, the, the highest being 9.7 episodes. So um, Thanksgiving rated really quite high um, and much higher than, um, you know, things like auditions, Christmas, crush, dies, jealousy and things like that. So um, topic potentially had an impact, um, but there might be that viewership um, coming in. So potentially that um, there were Thanksgiving specials um, hosted online at the time um, that raised the popularity of those. And I tested that again by looking at detail, details. So when you're looking at bars, for example, you can't see what's going on all the time. So with Deneb, I compared um, them down here so you can see the actual count, what's actually happening with the averages and um, the total distribution here. So that I could see um, just by glancing at something, um, you know, how how these compared to the rest of the distribution. So, you know, audition and Christmas um, pretty much performed lower than the average and things like Thanksgiving um, and the game kind of get more evenly distributed, but uh, concentrated up here. Um, jealousy was pretty much in the in the lower part of the distribution as well. Um, did anybody have any questions again? I'm about to go on to another segment. Everything all right? Shuanant, uh, could you please unmute yourself and ask your question? Sure. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, yes. Okay. 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 No, I can't hear you. Sorry. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Your voice is so low. Yeah. Uh, is that better now or is it same? Yes. Okay. Were you allowed to take any data points like this holiday season uh, to see if that also impacted people's ship? I could have, um, but I didn't want to invest the time in that because it's uh, more of a hobby uh, project. So. Um, Yes, I'm pretty sure I could have uh, looked at the timings of the episodes and, and drew that in as well um, to sort of formulate something a bit more solid. Sure, Anand, I, I think this is a great question as well because that kind of questions might make a great difference in, in, in getting the insight from the data. Mm, exactly. It's about way of thinking. Yeah, like something like the Super Bowl. Uh, it thing, so I'm sure the Thanks a lot for your question. Yeah, so um, and then it was about piecing the story together. So what um was I going to use, and and what did I think um would tell a, a good story? Um, and so the difference with this um, visual is that I decided um, purposefully that I was not going to dumb it down too much this time um, and that my audience, um, so that my pictured and my imagined audience would be, uh, would have a higher level of data literacy. 
Um, so, you know, I decided to keep these quite um, busy charts. Um, and um, I thought when telling my story, you know, what makes an episode popular, I wanted to um, set the scene. Um, so I was going to pop in, you know, that distribution of ratings and that uh, relationship between the ratings and the voters. Um, I was going to talk about how the final episode makes, um, you know, rates higher than the first episode, which might relate to viewership. Uh, some topics were more popular on average, which might relate to viewership. Um, you know, I wanted to say that characters didn't play much into the ratings, um, but directors did. And I wanted to end on that, you know, directors did, because that was probably the, the biggest um, insight of them all. And I thought it would be a, a good conclusion in sort of telling the story. And then going into the design. So um, the considerations, as I mentioned before, the audience, I decided to um, target a different audience. Um, and uh, other considerations into my design, I decided that, you know, I don't want to put too much colour in. Um, and um, I wanted to um, put words into the story as well, because I was using quite complex visuals. I think I needed to guide people through the story um, a little bit more to say, you know, to advise them what I'm trying to do and what I'm trying to say and where I'm going and what my questions were. Um, and the inspiration was the, the Friends logo. and um, from that, I wanted to um, have the title text throughout to have that that really scrawled look as well. But the rest of the text I wanted to be legible, so a normal uh, Sego font. Um, and all the visuals that had dots and points and rounded things, right? I wanted to have that primary color look. And um, all the visuals that were straight lines and, and blocks, I wanted to be black, right? Because these are these are straight lines and blocks and these are dots and points. So I wanted that um, consistency, and that played out in the type of charts that I produced. Um, but it also meant that there was quite compromise to be made as well in the visuals. So those scatter plots were really quite colourful and busy, um, and I decided to keep it that way, even though you know it might make sense to make them all one colour. Um, it helped balance the visual on on a whole. So that was a design compromise um, that I made. Um, and I'll go through as well. So, you know, it's not necessary to have all of those um, violin plots a different colour. They could have all been the same colour, but it just helped balance um, the visual. So, you know, colour makes it quite, quite even. And um, so the histograms I made black to um, counteract the colourfulness. So there wasn't too much colour on the page, but also to tie in with the friends theme. Um, and so then going through, um, starting to ask questions, and this is where I would improve the visual if I was to do it again, I would make um, tweaks to the commentary and the questions um, here and make it a little bit um, more obvious what the story was I was trying to tell, but that, that's okay. Um, I started, I would have perhaps started with a little introduction about you know, the friends episodes and things. Um, but then I, I, I went through and I tell people, well, this is the question that I'm asking and this is the answer that I'm, I'm looking at. So this is what it looks like visually. Oh, I haven't, um, if I go into the design. Ooh. Oh, it won't let me do it. There we go. Uh, titles. The, uh, where is it? The horrible comic sans. That's the only choice I had at the time. <laughs> it was the closest I had. Uh, <laughs> um, but it, it gave people, you know, indication of, of what they were looking at and why. And then um, the idea was to to highlight here the, the insights. So um, yes, there was a relationship between uh, voters and viewers and that there were clear outliers with respects to the votes cast. And so here, the pilot episode, the very, very first episode um, was the lowest in, I guess, respect to viewership. And this is the very, very last episode, which was the highest in, sorry, the highest rated and the most viewed. And this one was quite highly viewed. Um, but if I were to potentially normalize this and, and make um uh what was i saying 
anyway, never mind. I'll go on. <laughs> I can't forget what I was saying. Um, you know, is there a mid-season difference in ratings? So that's what I was looking for initially when I first um, delved into this. And then what I found was that ratings were on higher average. And then, um, you know, does the topic affect ratings? Well, this is what I found. But I left people to draw their own conclusions because I gave them the the, the number of episodes and the viewership um, as well so that they could draw their own conclusions. Um, does the appearance of key characters affect ratings? Well, not really, but because we have the entire data set, I can say that Ross scored on average higher than Phoebe, because um, that that is a uh, fact. And then um, the direct or if, does the director affect ratings? Um, yes, it does. And, and here are some of those those call outs. So that's that one. And then before I go on to share the next one. Anybody else want to have a, any more questions? Well, great way of visualization. Couldn't be explained better. Oh, thank you. I feel like I'm wobbling on a little definitely. bit. Definitely. I love your way, <laughs> way of uh, thinking, style of uh, de designing the visualization. Great. Yes, I can dribble a little bit. <laughs> All right. I think, it's, I think it's also a little bit inborn ability. I don't know. I'm not very talented person in terms of graphics, for example. So the next one here is the Harry Potter um, challenge as well. So um, this one had a much richer data set. Um, and here there were um, the chapters of the movies, the characters of the movies and what houses they were in, um, things about what ones they used, um, there was a data dictionary, the dialogue. So this had every uh, word that was spoken throughout all of the um, movies, um, which was extremely exciting for me. Um, I was very, very excited when I saw that, that data, um, the types of spells that they had, and then um, information about the movies. So the box office, the budget, the movie title, the release year, um, the locations within the film, um, and then the uh, types of spells that they cast. And it was a huge, like, wonderful, rich data set. And um, I was super excited to be exploring this. And um, it was an open ending um, question uh, challenge. And so, with that data, I was like, well, what are my questions? What do I want to know? Um, and I wasn't interested in, you know, the, the financials and the box office hits or anything like that. Um, and, you know, the um, the locations didn't really seem to, to tell me much about what I wanted to know and, and neither did this, you know, uh, the types of ones that they used. Um, but the questions that I really wanted to know, um, you know, what's the story? What can I can I get the story with data? Um, I know the story very well. I've read all the books and, and I watched the movies, but can I understand the story just by looking at the data? Um, and um, so the questions I had, you know, so who are the most important characters and what were the key relationships? Um, what do we know about the characters and their traits and um, how are the characters portrayed? Um, can I see that there's a gender diversity or you know, gender stereotypes at play? And can I find if there are any key story arcs that does the plot get heavier or more depressing over time? Um, and so thinking about that, well, what did I have on me at hand? What tools did I have for me to be able to, to find the answers to those questions? And so um, with the most important characters and what are the key relationships, you know, I could just do a count of the, um, the number of times that they spoke. Um, I could transform my data and work out um, where characters appear together in the same scene. Um, or I could, you know, just look at a, a network diagram to sort of visually see um, those relationships. Um, then I wanted to know about the characters and their traits. Well, how could I determine that? What did I have? And this is where I did pull in data from another data set, um, which I didn't do with the previous challenge, which I did with this one. Because I knew that there were behavioral qualities that can be um, gained from the houses. And that this is my prior knowledge. So each Harry Potter house um, has behavioral uh, qualities that they value. So things like cunning, leadership, wit, um, ambition, and things like that. Um, so I looked at the houses and then I also thought about 
potentially doing a textual analysis of common phrases to just understand people's traits um, and how the characters portrayed. So knowing that there's behavioral qualities from the houses, where were these people placed? Um, and, you know, could I see the gender by these behavioral qualities? So was there some stereotyping perhaps happening in here? And um, gender by um, parts spoken, right? So, um, you know, how much, how, how often did they, these uh, people appear? How often did they speak? How many words do they speak? And um, the key story arcs, and this one was interesting. So how could I find a story arc? You know, I could potentially do a sentiment analysis um, over the dialogue, um, which was going to be very costly for me. So I didn't do that. So I had to find another way of trying to get that sentiment um, with what I had and the tools that I had at hand. Um, another way was to, to look at the um, types of spells used and when. So what I did know about the spells was that, um, again, I brought in some more um, external knowledge and an external data set because I knew that some spells were curses and some were jinxes and some were um, were charms. And so um, I knew that charms were were less harmful, jinxes were um, tedious, like, um, mischievous and, you know, curses were intended to harm. And knowing that, I thought, well, maybe I could start to understand, um, you know, if there was, um, how, maybe there was more curses towards the end of the movies or, or so on, and if there were any key story arcs within individual episodes. And so that's how I interrogated the data that I had. Um, and then in the design as well. So, um, oh, I was expecting more to load, but I don't have anything else more to load. Um, my design's not great here. I'm not the most artistic person, but this was uh, my inspiration, which was the uh, more Marauders map. Um, so, you know, that parchment feel, the the moving foots and um, the, the text all along the page as well. And this inspired some of the visualizations and the shape that took place. And I took a little bit more liberty in, in the visuals here. They were um, not necessarily the most effective um, visuals to, to read the data itself, um, particularly this one down here, but the novelty of it was, um, was, you know, what made it a bit more engaging. And so this one, that's another thing with it comes to design is sort of trying to understand those compromises and what are the good compromises to make. And so um, with that, um, there was a bit more of a story in this one in terms that I can determine, well, these are the main characters. Um, but what I found was that Harry Potter appeared in about 92% of the scenes, which made this network diagram, if he was featured in it, um, really, really busy and really hard to determine. Um, the key relationships. So I had to remove Harry, Ron and uh, Hermione from this network diagram to see where the other relationship was. So you would assume that those three characters had a uh, connection to each of these characters. Um, but the key, you can see Fred and George Weasley were obviously um, twins. They appeared together pretty much all the time. Um, there's key relationships with Albus, um, Rubius, Severus and Minerva. Um, and then Harry Potter's um, non-magical family had no connection to the wizarding world, which we kind of knew here. So that was interesting. Um, well, not interesting. It was a, a nice expected um, thing to see. Um, and they were coloured, obviously, by house as well. So, um, And you can see the main connection. Oh, it doesn't matter. Anyway. If you're not Harry Potter fans, it's not interesting. <laughs> um, and then with the uh, character representation as well. Um, so the houses, so Gryffindor val values courage, bravery, nerve, and chivalry, right? So they are, you know, chivalry is a, a masculine trait, right? Um, so it's courage, bravery, nerve is, is generally considered to be uh, quite masculine um, values. And same with Slytherin. So the uh, ambition, cunning, leadership, and resourcefulness. Typically, in the past, I mean, I think times are changing. Um, typically, you know, considered male traits. And Ravenclaw values intelligence, learning, wisdom, and wit. Right. So um, that, that's kind of a bit more neutral. And Hufflepuff um, values hard work, patience, justice, and loyalty, which can be considered to be quite feminine traits. Um, I did stop short of making those linkages here um, because I didn't want to be presumptive, but um, I found this very, very interesting. 
because what I found was that the two main warring um, houses um, had the most amount of characters in them where uh, those two male um, dominated values and each of those houses had more male characters in them right and less female characters but the Ravenclaw and the Hufflepuff one which was more gender a bit more feminine traits had equal share of male and female um, characters in them and um, which I found interesting and um, so males had more so they didn't just have just more appearance like more characters um, they also had more speaking parts as well than females, excepting now Ravenclaw House, um, which I think when I did this again, I think it turned out to be Hufflepuff. I may have made a mistake in my calculations there. And so the reason that I chose this type of visual as well is a different visual because I really wanted to break those, those out um, as well and have that tree so that you could see all of that information in the one visual rather than having lots of separate visuals that you didn't have to click and interact with. And to do this, um, so I learned how to do it in Deneb much later, but I didn't at the time. Um, so I actually used raw graphs on the web um, to create this initial diagram. And um, it was uh, circular points here at the ends of the nodes. So I exported it as an SVG and changed the nodes to rectangle shapes um, in the SVG. And then what I then did was use a pure biz visual. Um, and then each of these shapes I could um, throw in and make a custom size. And then um, you can see here that I can filter by the character and the thing, uh, uh, the measure, and this will change the size. Um, so that's how I did, I can't uh, escape out of it. So that's how I did that one, which means that um, it's only partially dynamic. So if I click on one of these things, um, the bars do change, but you won't get any of the, the things resizing or thing, but it, because this, it wasn't necessary for this visual anyway. So, and then going on, so that was the, um, character representation, again, action and drama. So I looked at those spells and I used um, the Deneb custom visual here because I wanted to be, add a little bit of flourish and break out the um, jinxes, hexes and curses. So here's the spells, charms and enhancements down here. Um, the jinxes, hexes and cur curses, which are mischievous and, oh no, so the jinxes and hexes and then the, the curses up here. These, so these are the unforgivable curses. So these are the um, killing curse and the um, impediment curse and things like that. So um, the Vatica Kadaver being the killing curse. And what you can see here is that um, at a certain point in the time, um, the the, uh, the movies get a lot more serious and uh, there's a lot more action happening. Um, and it might relate to the you know young people's loss in innocence as well. So the as the movies progress, the spells become more um, insidious as well. So they become more action packed. And then text and tone. So I didn't have access to that sentiment analysis. The, the tool set wasn't easily at my disposal. So what I did know is that I did have the apostrophes and the question marks. And I had this wonderful aha moment um, that, um, you know, characters that are more exclamatory earlier in the um, epic because they've got a lot more exclamation marks down here and then they sort of ask more questions towards the end which made sense because they were more uncertain they, they didn't know what was going on um, things were changing around them um, until the very last um, uh, movie and then just a, and a word cloud as well to have a look at the phrases um, just uh, for one particular character which was Harry Potter and you can see that Yes, Professor was his um, most used phrase, um, meaning that potentially had a good relationship with his teachers. So that is basically where I'm at with that. So I'm all done. That was a great presentation. It was storytelling. Uh, Ashref is asking about, would you be able to share that PBX file? I could, I just need to tidy up a little bit. Okay, uh, I will 
add this link to, in, in the recording on our YouTube channel. You are great in, in expressing the details. <laughs> really? Yeah. Yeah, so they, I think I over, overthink they, they, sometimes. No, they, they, they look like very tiny touches, but it, they, they make a great difference. OK, any question from the audience? Please just unmute yourself if you have questions. They can be um, anything data is related. Don't have to be about those particular. Great session, Kerry. Thank you very much. No worries. Okay. Um. Yeah. Uh, Taras is asking. Reports looks like piece of art, Kerry. What is your opinion? Is the same creative and art approach work for business reports? Uh, the, yes, I would say so. So, um, def <laughs> yes, um, so aesthetic is very important um, when presenting to people. It gives that sense of confidence in the visuals um, if you very carefully craft it. I used to have a manager that was um, very particular and pedantic he was um quite uh, visual and he used to tweak my powerpoint presentations all the time like you know, a pixel to the left and a pixel to the right and up and down but he was very particular about the messaging um and a well-crafted message it makes quite a big bit of difference in business and communication and whether that is written or visual um so for sure yeah i would say so and and thinking creatively as well is is making sure that um, you're not just sort of making something completely whimsical. So having a creative visual can um, stem the boredom, right? It gets people more engaged. Like you know, you don't want to be in a PowerPoint like in a meeting and a PowerPoint presentation. Oh, it's just another bar chart, right? You just you just gloss over it. If it looks different, you don't gloss over it. You're reading into it and you're looking at it. Um, what was I saying? But yeah, you don't want things too whimsical. What was I saying? I don't know where I was going with that. Um, Aesthetics in business. But you say, yes, if, if you're thinking creatively as well, if you're thinking outside of the box, if you're thinking um, outside of those chart recommendations as well, you're thinking of ways to better visualize your, your visuals. So if you think about those scatter plots, right? I just took one scatter plot out of the box, but it wasn't showing me what I really wanted to see. There was more hidden under there. I had to sort of um, jitter it a little bit and um, so if I show you as well in terms of that same scatter plot um, uh, there was more information on it as well that you couldn't quite see so if I show you now uh, this one here where are we going um So that same scatter plot. So when you look at just this scatter plot here, right? Where's the density? Where, where do you see the most um, most ratings by votes and stars? Right? You're thinking it's about here, right? You think that's where most most of the concentration is. But when you add another um, layer onto it, so this is your histogram here and your density plot, and your histogram here and your density plot, it's not actually here. It's it's higher up, right? Your density is up here, it's higher than you thought it was. It's about there, right? Unless I've got it wrong. Is my mouse going wrong? <laughs> um, so, so it's all these visual illusions as well. If you're thinking creatively, that you you got to think past um, that as well. So, if you did your stars and your ratings just as a bar chart, for example, you're not going to see that same same thing. I don't know if I made any sense, but. <laughs> I'm wondering what Kerry's favorite custom visuals yes, are. Well, that's that obvious. <laughs> <is asking. laughs> um, I like the HTML content visual, the denim visual, and the pure vis visual. Uh, I like the bullet charts and the violin plot as well. Okay. I think we are done. Uh, 
thanks a lot for this wonderful uh, meetup, Kerry. Really, uh, it was it was an eye opener for me. But it's very difficult to find people that thinks uh, like yourself. It's a combination of many, many tiny things, but they are so important to create the, such a visual, such a visualization. All right. It is. It's a combination of that, that math, science, art, um, and you know that psychology as well, and you know communication. It's, it's a it's a broad range of things that you you mix into the data visualization for sure. Exactly. Okay. Uh... I think we are done with the questions. Last chance to ask question to Kerry. OK. Thanks a lot again. Uh, thanks. The, I would like to see you more in the ne 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 next uh, meetings. Oh, I see <laughs> the timing's a bit difficult, so thanks for accommodating me. My pleasure, my pleasure. Thanks a lot. Cheers, bye. Goodbye, everyone.